Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wild away. 6, 56 degrees. I have to say, you know, you try not to pick favorites among your episodes, but that's really one of my favorites. And one of the things that I really love about that is uh, Bruce Zimmerman, who's our film scorer, I think he really knocked it out of the park on that episode in terms of the music. So uh, it's actually an Emmy contender this year, so cross your fingers. Um, so uh, does anybody have any questions before we move on? Really, this whole crowd, no questions. Yes, there's a hand way back. Well, the theory is that they mostly do it by sensing the pressure from the fish next to them. So that they, they respond almost like one fish pushes the next one through water pressure. Um, but they clearly also just watch each other for cues, which is another thing that's been shown. Uh, but it is kind of a, uh, amazing how uh, so many animals can work almost as a single unit, especially when they're mobbing sharks. Yes. Um, so how, how close was I? The thing that's interesting is that actually in most of those shots where it looks like you're about, say, six feet from a shark, uh, you're actually more like three feet from the shark. And the reason for that is because water is not particularly clear. And in order to create the clearest possible image on screen, you use extremely wide angle lenses on the cameras uh, so that you can get really, really close to things uh, and have the minimum amount of water between you and the subject for the, n the most clarity. Uh, so the illusion there is that it actually makes it look like you were further away, because you're very close, but with a very wide shot. Objects in mirror are uh, closer than they appear. Um, so, but the thing is that I have a very, very special protection from sharks when I'm filming. And that is that when I'm filming, the sharks are only this big in my viewfinder. So they really aren't that dangerous. They're very small. And actually, there's a, there is this feeling that when you're filming and you're watching on the viewfinder that things are quite small and they're not really much of a threat. And every once in a while, you look over and you go, oh, yeah, that is a shark. But no, the reality is that sharks are just uh, the, the biggest problem that you have with filming sharks is getting close to them because they're scared of you. Um, you know, they are not out to eat people. Uh, they eat fish and stuff. Or if you're a great white, they eat seals. They, they don't really think of people as food. And when you're underwater, especially with all your scuba gear on, you are this giant, ugly, bubble-blowing, noisy thing that does not belong. The absolute last thing that they are thinking is, boy, does that look delicious. What they're really thinking is, what is that? Get me out of here. So the hardest part with sharks is getting them to stay around. And it's interesting because the sand tigers in North Carolina, those are one of the only species of sharks you'll ever see in the world that you can film without having to feed them. Most sharks, the only way you get them to stay around is by feeding them. And you draw them in and you sort of gain their trust by giving them some food. Um, but the sharks, the sand tigers in North Carolina, have gotten used to people to the point where they're okay with you being there and, and you're not feeding them. They're just hanging out, doing their thing. Who else? Yes, sir, right here. Oh, man, they would hover. I have one take of that shark that's like 17 minutes long. Uh, until I guess it finally got tired of the lights in its eyes and decided to leave. Um, but yeah, and then another one would come and take its place. But they will, they will hover for a pretty long time. No, there isn't. So now it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, there, are, there are two types of respiration in sharks, okay? So there's, there's, there's what's called buckle pumping, which is you probably saw that shark was gulping water. And, and that is a trait that most fish can do, but not all sharks. So about, I don't know, 80% of the shark species can buckle pump, meaning they can pump water over their gills by swallowing. Uh, and then there are species that cannot. 
uh, hammerheads being one of the prime examples. Um, they have to keep swimming to breathe. But it's a common misconception that all sharks have to keep swimming to breathe. Actually, quite a few species, actually the vast majority, do not need to keep swimming to breathe. And in fact, you see like nurse sharks, lemon sharks, tiger sharks, reef sharks. A lot of sharks will just, when they get tired of having to stay up off the bottom by swimming because they are heavy and they sink, and their, their pectoral fins are wings that they literally use for lift. When they get tired of having to swim for lift, they'll just settle to the bottom and they'll just breathe and they'll just chill out. And you'll come up to them and they'll just like, yeah, man, I'm just hanging here, man. It's all good. So, um, yeah, so the sand tigers are one of those guys that can buckle pumps. So they could theoretically, if they want to, just settle down and rest. Though I will admit I have never actually seen a sand tiger shark resting on the bottom. Maybe they don't like to do it. Yes, right here. Yes, good, good observation. Um, I've totally gone through my rebreather phase, and I'm done with it. Uh, they're just too much of a pain in the neck um, to carry all the stuff. Uh, so I'm using, believe it or not, a very modern take on a very old school Jacques Cousteau era regulator. It's a double hose regulator. So the regulator's in the back, and the air comes around this hose, and then when I exhale, it goes out, and it goes out the back. Uh, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for underwater photography because it keeps the bubbles out of my mask where I'm trying to look through a viewfinder. And the other thing that I love about it is that when you're shooting in an upward angle, the bubbles are back here so they stay out of your frame. Uh, and I got interested in double hose regulators a few years ago and there's a company in Florida called Vintage Double Hose that restores old r double hose regulators and makes them new again and puts modern internals in them. And... Um, They've built me a couple of regulators that I love like you can't imagine, and uh, they're, they're my workhorse. So good observation, but yeah, it keeps the bubbles behind your head. And then the bubbles are just a little bit further from the critter. So if you are filming something down on the sand, something small, instead of having the bubbles right behind the camera, they're another 18 inches back, which does help. Way in the back, yes, sir. There are tons. There are tons. Um, there are some people in the Keys that have figured out how to grow coral on a farm underwater. We did a segment on them. Um, you can see it on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, there are people all over the world that have figured out how to farm coral, although I'm not sure how successful they've been at actually restoring entire reefs. It's an awful lot of coral to plant. Um, however, I will say this, that the... The idea that coral reefs are completely dying out isn't really true. Um, we have a massive El Nino that's been going on that has had its way with the Pacific corals, and it's been pretty horrible. But these events tend to be cyclical, and they, and they calm back down again, and most of the coral generally comes back. The other thing to remember that is that the Earth has been through massively warmer times than now. Uh, we've been, in, in, in previous interglacials, we've been... 50 to 100 feet higher on sea levels, uh, 20 degrees warmer than we are now. And what that does is it effectively co pushes coral reefs into higher latitudes where the water temperature is right. So um, the Earth's climate is in a constant state of change, and I'm not trying to make a statement on climate change, but the Earth's climate, we've been in periods of time where the oceans were 300 feet lower than they are today during ice ages and 100 feet higher than they are today during interglacials. And corals have managed to survive by going to where they want to be. They, you know, they release larvae, they move, they land where they're happy. So the climate is not constant. It never has been. Um, our coastlines are not constant. They never have been. They're constantly in a state of change. And um, it, it is not true that the coral reefs of the world are all just dying out. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about the environment, but I'm just saying let's not be alarmist about it. Um, the, the barrier reef is, is still going to be here when your grandchildren are around, trust me. It's still going to be here. Uh, yes, sir. The lighting? Well, in that segment, the lighting's kind of boring. Um, just couple of big old lights on the camera uh, to, to throw light 
on the shark. Um, and then the trick is to try to balance the lighting with the background a little bit so you, the shark isn't really bright and the background's really dark. And, and that's accomplished in a very high-tech manner by adjusting the brightness of the lights until it looks good. Yeah, it's called the eyeball technique. Um, when we do um, cave segments or stuff like that, we employ a lot more sophisticated lighting where we place lights and there's backlights and you have to do more like lighting of the set, if you will. But in a case like this where you're trying to shoot marine life, you really don't have any time for that. You're just trying to get into a spot where the animal will tolerate you. And so lighting is, is done you know, very much on the fly, but not very high tech at all. Um, we've come around to uh, using LED lights now. The technology is so phenomenal um, with LEDs. Uh, you know, first it was halogen, then it was HIDs, and I could never make HIDs work for me. They were just so problematic. They always broke. They never turned on. They, I hated it, HIDs. I actually went from um, halogen to HIDs and back to halogen because the HIDs were so problematic. And now we have LED lighting, and it's it's just wonderful. Uh, you know, variable variable uh, brightness without a shift in color temperature, extremely long burn times, and um, really, really powerful. So we've got up to 30,000 lumen LED lights that we can employ. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, yes, sir, back there. Um, the water temperature in North Carolina, I think uh, we were there in the fall, and it was pretty high. I want to say it was around 80, 85, 84. Um, and in fact, that was the reason we had a hard time finding the sharks. When water gets that warm, they go deeper. And it was hard to find a wreck where they are. If you go to North Carolina in May, when the water's like 72 to 75, much colder, there are a lot more sharks. So in fact, we're actually going to do another segment where we're going to go back and see the difference this coming in, two, in a month, in two months, in May, and see what they're like in the cooler water. Yes, sir, in the red. I've not been that deep. Um, Tanya's been deeper on one breath than I've been on a whole tank. I think I've only been to 200 feet in my life. Um, deep diving is a specialty uh, that's quite a bit more dangerous uh, than shallow diving uh, just because of narcotic effects of the uh, gas you breathe and everything else. And um, for me, as a kind of a marine life guy, as a, as a, as a filmmaker, the deeper you go, the, the less there is to film. There's worse light. Um, there's not as many species. Of course, I'll say that, and there's the deep fish guys that go to 500 feet and find new species of fish, and that's a whole other thing that... But, you know, I, I'm just... Um, I'm not a... Honestly, I'm, a, I'm more of a filmmaker and less of a technical diver, so going, going really deep and doing dangerous stuff it is not really my interest and definitely would be vetoed by my wife. She's not into that whole getting dead thing. So, yeah... Yes. Well, we definitely um, we definitely go to a location with you know a subject in mind. Um, so you know I've been to North Carolina a dozen times over the last twenty years, so I know what to expect there. Um, but the specifics of a story are, it's interesting, it, 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 you never exactly know how it's going to go, with marine life especially. If you're doing a cave, you've done some research, the cave's not going anywhere, you know what the story's about, you can pretty much write the whole script and go down and shoot it scene for scene. And we do that often with uh, stuff that, or subjects that we know are going to be predictable, like a cave or a shipwreck. Um, but very often you go into a wildlife situation you just don't know what's going to happen and so we basically we go down and we completely wing it which is pretty much how natural history films get made you completely wing it you've got a shot list of things you really love to film and you try to get them and you don't get about half of them and then you get about a bunch of things more that you didn't think of that you never even knew like you're going to capture a shot of a shark hovering and, and you're going to scratch your head and go, how do they do that? And then you're going to do some research and you're going to go, oh, man, this is like a really cool thing to talk about. And that happens a lot. And so you come, and I used to freak out about this. Like, 
what's the story? Like, I'm freaking out. I'm going to come home, and I'm not going to know what. And now we've sort of gotten like, eh, you know, we'll figure it out, whatever. Uh, so uh, it, it kind of, and one of the nice things about this show, so this show started as a television show. And it was half-hour episodes, and it would be composed of two or three segments. So it's what's called a magazine format show, okay? Like 2020, 60 Minutes, uh, a show. Those shows are hour-long, and they had like, you know, 15, 20-minute segments. And those segments are about separate different things. Well, this show started out the same way. Uh, you know, 9 to 15-minute segments about different things. So if the first segment is about sharks and people don't like sharks, you know, the next segment's about something totally different. So maybe they'll hang around to see that segment. Um, the good thing about that was that we've always been able to let the segments be whatever length they want to be. This segment's like, I forget, like nine minutes, something like that. I didn't have to pad it out to 12 where it doesn't want to be, and I didn't have to cut it back to 6 where it doesn't want to be. I could just let it be 9. Nine's good. And then when it came time to package the shows into half hours, you've got all these segments, and you can go like, this one's 9, this one's 14. And you can pull them together, and you can pick them and get them pretty close to the right runtime of a half-hour show. Um, and the nice thing about that is you, don't, you can really just let a segment be whatever runtime it wants to be, and that is pretty short, you know, nine minutes. I could make an interesting nine minutes about virtually anything. You know what's hard? Making an interesting hour about, vir if I had to make an hour out of sand tiger sharks, you would all be asleep. I'm sorry, they're interesting, but they're not that interesting. All right, but to do it for nine minutes, I can make that interesting. So in a lot of ways, filmmaking in this format is a lot easier than trying to make a half hour or an hour or, God forbid, 90 minutes on a subject. Um, so in a lot of ways, I can make myself look like a genius by doing this because if you can't make nine minutes off sharks, interesting. I, like, you should go back to film school or something. So uh, any other questions? All right, one more, and then we'll hit the next one. Yes. I'm sorry? How old when I started diving? About 20. 20? About that. 8, 19, 20. So I was in college. This is a good story, so thank you for that. This is a good, this is a good little story to tell. This is kind of fun. I was in college, and I could not understand. I went to Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, engineering school. And uh, I was an electrical engineering major, and I could not understand why on earth you pay all this money to go to college, and they make you take gym. Really? Like, you got to take gym? So... The first semester that I had to take gym, I took badminton, okay? Now, I thought badminton would be really easy. You know, I'm imagining badminton from my youth, like on the lawn, boom, boom, you know. No. So there's a very high Asian population at WPI. And these people take badminton very seriously, and they ran me around the court until I was dead. And I decided that that was not a good thing to take. So the next semester that I had to take a gym class, I took softball. I cannot play softball, as it turns out. I'm not really good at that at all. So I didn't take softball again. And the next time, they offered scuba. So I took scuba diving. And it was either good or bad, because uh, the very first time I actually dove in the ocean, I realized that that was what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, it was instantaneous. I knew the first time I went under the ocean, and I was freezing my butt off in Massachusetts in March in 35-degree water in an ill-fitting wetsuit that was a rental that someone else had most certainly peed in. Um, looking at this little lobster going across the sandy bottom, and I, I knew this is what I want to do with my life. My dad's going to be so angry because they just put me through engineering school. Uh, so... That was the long answer of that, and um, if I can give you one piece of advice related to that, if you're going to change careers and do what you love, you should just do it, and don't wait till it's too late, because once you get five weeks of vacation, and you got kids in school, you're not, you're not going to do it. Do it when you're young, do your passion now, and uh, do what you love with your life, because otherwise you're just going to not like your job, and it's just going to be boring, so that's my, that's my life advice. So, um... The next, uh, the next, what's the next one? 
Yes. All right. The next one, a little bit, little bit longer. Um, this, doing this segment was actually a dream for me. Um, I had wanted to do this for a number of years. And um, when my wife, Christine, got inducted into the Women Divers Hall of Fame in 2000-something, yeah, you go, girl. She had all these connections now through, like, the sisterhood of diving chicks, you know? And these people would never answer my phone call, but then she met the head of Noah through this thing and said, oh, yeah, my husband wanted to do a, 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 a show on Aquarius. And she said, oh, tell me more. I'm like, well, they won't return our phone calls. And she sent this email that was like, Jonathan's coming down to do a, a show on Aquarius. Make it happen. Thank you. It was like a three-sentence email. And the next thing you know, I got a phone call from the director of, from the head of the guy who runs it, Aquarius, like, hey, uh, so you want to come down and do a segment on Aquarius? So we got to go down. So uh, this is uh, what came of it. And what was kind of interesting about this segment, I'm, we're both very proud of this. Um, Aquarius had just lost their funding. This was a couple of years ago. They had lo Noah didn't have any money to support him anymore. And they were trying to privatize Aquarius. They're trying to sell it to some, uh, you know, a university or someone that would run it privately without public funding. And um, they were desperate for PR. And they came to us and they said, hey, you know, you're going to be doing all this filming. Could you do like maybe a five minute promo about like what Aquarius is and how it works that we could use to maybe try to attract someone that would be interested in supporting us or buying us or, or whatever? And so we said, sure, you know, we'll tell anybody anything to get the filming done. You know, yeah, sure, yeah, you're going to have my firstborn, whatever. Um, so we, we, we promised them that we would do that, and then we shot it, and they came back and said, so when can you do that thing for us? And we said, you know, like, if we're going to do it, let's do the best possible thing we can do for Aquarius. And in my mind, the best possible thing we could do for Aquarius was to basically move the, that project to the very front of our editing line and do our Blue World episode about Aquarius and not mess around with some five-minute thing for those guys. Let's do what we, we're going to do. Let's do the really awesome, however long it turns out to be, could be nine minutes, could be 15, let's let it be where it wants to be, like what we do, and let's just do the best possible job we can and let them use that to promote it. Uh, and we did that, and they did use it to promote it, and um, we, we heard back from them several months later that they had attracted Florida International University to take over, and that they thanked us and said that our segment was uh, extremely helpful in making that happen because it was the single best video they had ever seen that in just 15 minutes explains what is Aquarius and what's it good for. Uh, and so we were really pleased that Aquarius still exists in some small part because of Blue World. And so here it is. And you're going to have a lot of funny questions after this one. And do I have a couple of funny stories to go with it? <laughs> All right. So I have to tell you a funny story about this. So the, the first time we did that walkthrough, I'm saying what everything is, you know, I'm doing the walkthrough. And I pull back the curtain to the bathroom. And I lift up the lid and I go, and here's the head, the toilet. And I open it up and it's all moldy in there. It's clear that nobody's used that toilet in a long time. And now there's a whole bunch of people in this place that must be going to the bathroom somewhere. So uh, the question was where? So I, I pulled one of the guys aside and said, um, he said, yeah, don't, don't show that. I'm like, uh, uh, where do people poop. Uh, and he says, well, so what they do is uh, when you have to do the number two, you put on your bathing suit, you go outside, um, and they have one of those, uh, what do they call those things? The gazebos, thank you. They have one of those gazebos right outside the door. So you duck under into the gazebo, and um, you put your butt kind of out, and you take your bathing suit off, and, and you do your thing. And the fish clean up. So 
I can tell you, don't go fishing anywhere near the Aquarius. <laughs> you don't want to eat that fish. I'm just saying. So if you want to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, it's, it's going to take a while. So, yeah, that was the first thing I, I learned about that. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's not common knowledge. Don't tell anybody I told you that. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions? I've got to get a move on because we're running behind schedule, and I want to make sure you get to see the third one. So I'm not going to answer too many questions, but yes. Yes, we've, we've, we've filmed um, pretty much anywhere you can think of. Um, yeah, we've done a, quite a few segments in Australia, although we want to get back down and go to South Australia because there's some really cool stuff there, like the, uh, the little, the, those giant cuttlefish spawning event. Oh, man, that's going to be cool. We're going to do that. So, yes. Uh, yes, way back there. I have no idea. Why? Uh, it, could, it could be. I don't know. I don't know that. Mm. All right. One more. Who, who haven't I called on for? Yes, sir, you. Yes. It was fine. Why? Well, you know what's really funny about the food there is that it seems like under pressure your taste buds don't work that well, and everything kind of tastes not that interesting, except for chocolate still tastes really good. Um, and what's interesting about the, the aquanauts is that they're in the water for so many hours, and they're so cold when they come out for lunch and when they come out at the end of the day for dinner um, that they eat. They said that no matter how much they eat, they lose like 10 pounds when they're in there for a week. So it's a good weight loss program, apparently, because you basically shiver the whole week. Sorry. All right, so we're going to run this next one. What's the next one? Huh? Oh, this is one of my favorites. Yeah, we picked good ones for tonight, didn't we? All that brainstorming was awesome. Yeah, so um, I learned about this place from a friend who was on a National Geographic shoot. And um, when I found out about it, I had to do it. And it took a while to get the permits to do it. What you're going to see tonight is not something that is something that the average person can go do. You have to, well, it's in Mexico. You got to like pay the right people or something. I, I, I don't exactly know how the permit came to be. But um, we, we, we got the permit and we got to go shoot this. And it's uh, a really fun episode that's kind of spooky. So let's, uh, let's roll it and I'll tell you more later. All right. Yeah. So that was a fun one to make. <laughs> Anybody have any questions on that one? Yes. Probably not, but I'm not sure. I don't really know what those guys eat, but they are uh, typically, you know, evolved over you know, huge amounts of time to live in complete darkness on what's there. Um, so I doubt that they, but you never know. I mean, maybe they have adapted to eat the occasional thing that falls in. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Yes, sir. Um, that, that second dive, I think that, I mean, it's not a tremendously deep cenote. I think that the deepest we got in there was about 110 or something like that. And, um, but we were able to find enough stuff to film shallower than that, that we didn't spend much time down there. We went down to the deepest part for one particular shot. Um, I, I don't remember exactly, but, you know, around an hour, an hour and 20, something like that. Um, what was nice about... That particular cenote, if, if you're familiar with cenotes, there's typically a debris pile in the middle where the top fell in. And that one, even though the opening is quite small, apparently a large portion of the ceiling had fallen down at some point. There's a fairly large debris pile. And so uh, in the very center of it, I think the shallowest it comes up to is only about 25 feet. So there was a really nice area to swim around and look at things 
to do deco. So it wasn't just hanging there being bored. So we could come up to 25 feet and look at, um, actually there were a lot of those little blind cave fish and stuff swimming around in the shallows. So it was something to film. Yes. It was definitely freaky, definitely. Especially the very first one that I saw, it was pretty freaky. And it was kind of a weird thing because like, I really wanted to film that so I knew what I was going to see. I was expecting it because I had, I had seen pictures and, and I knew what it was. But still, there's, when, you, when you wrap your head around the idea that these are human remains, it's sort of like, kind of, yeah, it is a little bit freaky. Yes. Well, you know, some of them were kind of far. I mean, I would say that the inside of that thing, like at the surface of the water, was like the size of this room. Um, and so if the thing's right in the center and there's bodies way over there, you know, down 90 feet on a shelf, you got to wonder if that was a, a person that was alive that swam to the side. You know what I mean? And then they eventually drown and then they go down. So... Um, they're, they're, to me, I'm not knowing anything about archaeology or any. To me, it just seems logical that at least some of those people got thrown in still alive, which is kind of nasty, kind of morbid. Um, yeah. Well, uh, you're you're pretty far. You're pretty far from the ocean. Um, those are. Now you're going to ask me for like miles, but like. They're right around Meridus. If you look on Google, you can figure out Meridus, you know, not particularly close to the ocean. It's pretty far inland. Why? I'm curious. Just curious. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because those people that have done, um, like, some kind of uh, cave diving in the, in the Yucatan, if you've been to, like, Playa del Carmen, the, the areas that are really known for cave diving, they have very long cave systems that go thousands of feet underwater, and, and you, can, you, can, you can pop up you know, like a mile away in another cenote. In Merida, they don't really do that. They don't go very far. There's a lot of cenotes, but they don't have, they don't typically have particularly big cave systems with them. Yes. Your favorite shark is a whale shark? Well, mine's the hammerhead, but I like whale sharks too. That's cool. Right. <laughs> Is that about, are we out of time, John? Are we pretty good on, should we get one more? Or what do you think? All right, we got one more question. All right, red shirt man. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> How many of those bodies were recent? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that I, I don't know. I, I, I would say that if you were, I have two pieces of advice if you go there. One, uh, make sure someone knows that you're going there so they come to look for you when you don't come home for dinner. Uh, and two, definitely don't pay the guys that are going to pull you out until they've pulled you out. That's what I'm just saying. All right, John has a couple so last minutes. I have minute. just, uh, and don't go away. Don't go oh. away. Um, so I have just have uh, one more th announcement I forgot to uh, tell you all that uh, this Science on Screen, which is, th this is part of Science on Screen, is funded by um, Sloan Foundation, and it's a, uh, an ongoing series that was started at, in, in uh, Jonathan's uh, state of Massachusetts, Brookline, Massachusetts, at Col Co Coolidge Corner Theater, and uh, then pioneered from there out through all of, uh, the, uh, all of the whole country. And uh, their object is to use a film as a, a medium in order to teach people science. I think we've taught a little science tonight. There was some science yeah, somewhere some in science. there. There might have been some yeah, science. Yeah. So uh, if you want to see other uh, science on screens that are um, coming up, you can grab the uh, Rafael Film Center quarterly calendar on the way out. And can we have some applause for this man? Yeah, man. <laughs> no, seriously, thanks for coming out. Thank Again, you, Jonathan. It's hard to get people off the couch. You should be proud of yourselves. You're off the couch and into the chair. But, yeah. <laughs> thanks for having me, and thanks for coming.